Uh, the disadvantage of having uh, parallel sessions is you can't be in two places at once, right? All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mihir Shah. His talk is Avoid Respins, uh, Designing PCBs in the Age of Prototyping from the Manufacturer's pers per Perspective. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of PCBLayout.com and director of special projects at Royal Circuits. Formerly an electrical engineer at Tesla and Taser, uh, he now develops or helps Royal Circuits constantly push the limits of manufacturability, building more complex boards faster and more cost effectively. In addition, he works with different programs and partnerships that allow Royal Circuits to continue bringing value to its customers in the larger hardware community. Please welcome me here. Thank you. Thank you for the great and very formal introduction. I never get those, so that's awesome. So, so yeah, like Dan said, today's talk is about, the main purpose of today's talk is to really bring you guys in to the, from, the, from the manufacturer's perspective of what really goes on in a board shop and why boards cost money <laughs> at all. Because I know you guys love to get everything real cheap for free. You guys use a free CAD tool and then you gotta pay for the boards. So we'll kinda go over why that is, what things cost more, and how you can then factor these notes back into your design to design more cost effectively for manufacturability, for scaling, etc. So how many of you guys have actually ordered a PCB your, yourself? Okay, that's pretty amazing. Who, just like a show, kind of sample the room, like who do you, who do you use for boards? PCB way, China, okay. Osh Park, Jails, AP Circuits, okay. We build almost all their boards in, in Canada. They're a really, really great customer of ours from Royal. Okay, yeah, so it's a good sample of the room, but the trend I'm seeing is price sensitive, correct? So as you guys design more complex electronics, this becomes even more of a concern. So now that you guys have kind of told me where you're getting your boards, the first thing I want to show you is me shutting up and I'm going to show you a view of just our fab shop because I can take a video of it. It's a high speed walkthrough, but just kind of take a note of what you're going to see. So that's, that's our shop in, in the Bay Area, but what I want you all to look for is just the number of people and the number of hands that even a two layer board has to touch. So you have our cam team, more inside sales, quoting, support, and then you go across the street to the actual fab, and this is where you see the complexity and what's actually involved in building a fabrication fa facility. Material, test, AOI. You have wet process after wet process, all these different bats and chemicals that even a two-layer board that you want to pay a dollar for has to go through. You have seven drills, you have stack up, or lay up, lamination, route, second drill, route, via fill, et cetera. But you see just like the complexity in building a company and a factory around making boards of whatever complexity, and what you find is no matter the complexity, 90% of the steps are the same. All these boards still need to be imaged and etched and go through test and AOI and drill and solder mask and legend and the list goes on and on, and all those things have generally a person associated with it, all those things have a machine associated with it, and thus they all have a cost associated with it, correct? So just at a high level, but obviously you aggregate systems, Oshpark, Eisler have done an incredible job being able to aggregate and bring the cost down per user. But as you start developing more complex electronics, just understanding why. So in any design, you generally can break it up into four main goals. You'd like your design to be manufacturable, You'd like it to be cost effective. You want to get it as fast as possible and be able to iterate as fast as possible. And you'd like it to ultimately be somewhat scalable or at least manufacturable across different manufacturers, whether you go here or in China. You want to understand the yields, like Patrick, Patrick talked about in the Eisler talk, and, and things like that. So these are the four main goals. So thinking about these, what can you do when you're working with your manufacturer for the first or second time to make sure these are playing into effect and as you design. So 
How many of you guys were at the Eisler talk with Patrick? Okay, so you guys remember the nice note on, on, <laughs> on fab prints, correct? So for most simple boards, yeah, avoid the fab print, bake it into the data as much as possible, be very clear. But this is the reality of what a fab print that we get every single day, and we, we're doing literally hundreds of quotes a day for all these different companies all over, and everybody has a different fab sheet, and like 98% of engineers will not necessarily go through everything that was on their company's standard sheet. So it's a two-layer board. We're reviewing it. It's supposed to be easy peasy, no big deal. You know, bare metal price. We're just gonna throw it through the shop on a one-day turn, no problem. But then we get to the end of it and it says class three. We're like, uh, how is that even possible? But we can't assume. So now we gotta pause it. I gotta reach out to the engineer and say, hey, is this thing really a class three board? He's like, what? No, just get it through the shop. Like simple, I don't even care if you put solder mask on it. <laughs> but how can you know that, right, prior? so. Avoid the fab sheet, and if you're going to have one, be like extra meticulous in the pre-process. And that's something you'll probably hear, whether you're a professional engineer or not, is just like in your design, double and then triple check before you send it to the fab because we don't know. So a good fab will pause and reach out to you, thus still wasting time, and a bad fab will either miss it or ignore it. So you're just going to come out losing no matter what you do anyways. So in general, provide the correct information up front and then choose your manufacturer wisely, so at least you're gonna to be told and be in the know with the transparency. So, at the highest level, this is, these are the general inputs that you will want to have ready to send to your manufacturer if you're going direct to a manufacturer for all the different three processes. So if it's for fab, have either your native CAD files, not every fab shop accepts those. We do, all the aggregate guys like Isler and Oshpark, they do as well but some people need Gerbers, some people are okay today accepting ODB++, just have those. And then, it's good to do this even if you want standard, just say I'd like your standard stack up with one ounce copper and we're gonna use FR4 and it's hassle finish, green solder mask, etc. But if you're not sure, just be meticulous, just put it in there in a fab note, be okay with the stack up because they can look like this, like this is our standard four layer stack up, so. For assembly, same deal. Either you can put your native like ODB++ that has everything baked in, or you could send like the design files and then the bill of materials and XYRS. XYRS is just location on the board per part and it's the pick and place file. So centroid file, X, X, Y, rotation, and then side, top or bottom of board. So generally you can get it from the CAD tool yourself. Like all team and all these guys have pretty standard ways on how to find them. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head how to get it for each one, but that's a good thing to put in a rev to with this presentation. <laughs> and then for layout, because we do layout as well, and a lot of other people do too, it's your schematic file and the parts libraries if they're not baked into one. And then, of course, any notes, component placement, mechanical outline of the board, etc. So DFM, and this is something you guys have probably heard throughout this day and conference, Try to bake in the DFM into your design rules. Ideally, work with the manufacturer to get those design rules into what they're checking for and what their tolerances are, especially for more constrained boards. But in general, the main things, the issue is all these CAD tools are so powerful and they let you do kind of anything, right? You have this really, really tight pitch package and you could run one mil traces and put stacked vias and you're like, this is great. Everything routed, this is perfect. And then you go to a fab guy like me and I charge you $100,000. And you're like, what's going on? Or, or it's not manufacturable. So just try to understand like what are the limitations. Not every fab shop can handle laser micro, micro vias under five mils. Not every fab shop can do two and two. And no fab shop can do two mil traces if your copper weight is like four ounces. So understanding the trade-offs, and these are things that are not baked into the CAD tools, like your stack up and your copper weight and how that affects design, understanding the limitation of what can the actual fabricator I'm going to use handle, and if they can't handle it, what's it going to cost me? Right? What are the adders in the design? Tight vias, anything that requires us to use a special machine or outside the norm is certainly gonna cost because that's a special skill with labor and machine time and things like that associated. But basically, if you are aware of the DFM tools, copper traces, you have a very strong and clear fab print, 
and your stack of information is aligned with the manufacturers or you have something that you know they can build and the material is available when it's, it's not price sensitive or whatever, then you're in good shape. So this is what I was talking about earlier. This is a good sheet to just have on reference and this is our minimum trace in space per copper weight. So that changes. As you increase your copper weight, the smallest and the thinnest you can make your trace changes and it increases with increasing copper weight. And the reason for that is because when you etch, the etching process is not perfectly linear. You don't run traces through an etcher, the, the plain copper, and they etch it out. It doesn't work like a nice vertical wall. It actually etches like a trapezoid. So what happens is if you have really thick copper, you have a long way to etch down to the bottom, and your traces are too close, it's going to etch like this, and they're going to touch before you can get to the bottom. So you're going to get an internal short if your traces are too close together. And yeah, etching gets better and better, but it's not perfect, so you're still limited. So in general, I mean, two mil trace on four ounce copper, you're crazy if you did that. But try not to. So if you have a really, really high power board, you wouldn't want to use thin traces anyways. But understanding what your manufacturer is capable of and just general understanding of how boards are constructed will, will help you guys make good design decisions and what, what you tra plan to do. And also that affects the yield. And so, again, I'm bringing up great points from Patrick's Eisler talk because he took so many points that I wanted to be the first to introduce. But yield is a really, really good point. And you should ask your manufacturer. If you ask me and I don't know you, I'll just tell you you got 100% yield. But really, I mean, depending on the board, if it's a really complex board and we only get a 50% yield and the manufacturer doesn't tell you, when you go to your next manufacturer, they might charge you differently, and then when you scale up, you could be in serious trouble. If you had a 50% yield on 10 boards, and then you went to 10,000 boards, that's 10,000 boards or 5,000 boards that are scrap, and no manufacturer is going to handle that. So thank you, Patrick, for that, the catalyst for that kind of discussion. So yeah, same kind of, these are just some examples. So a minimum trace in space for a BGA, generally three and three. If you get tighter, you're going to have to use a blind via. Does everyone know what a blind via is? So just a via inside the board. A blind via is a via inside the board that you can't see all the way through. So it starts on one of the outer layers, but it ends on an inner layer. So it's you have a BGA package on the outside. You route from outside and it stops on layer two or three of a four-layer board. So you can't see all the way through it. It's blind. And a buried, it starts all the way buried. So it's only in between the board. You can't see the opening or ending. It's an internal connection on the board. But the reason that costs so much money, like it's doable, but we're saying it's going to require blind via. But the reason that's even worth noting is because that's going to cost you more money. And the reason it costs you more money and maybe take more time, because it might need via fill or if it has VN pad, et cetera, is because we have to run a full additional drill cycle just to handle that one particular blind via. Normally, a board is constructed, you do your imaging, you get all your layers together, then you do drill at the end once everything's together and you have full through holes. But if you have a blind via, I have to do an internal construction, an internal lamination cycle, so that's four hours in the press, which is expensive and time consuming because other boards can't get in it. And then I have to run it into the drill, and then you have to do your deburring, you have to do all your different sort of cleanup and parts associated with the, the drilling itself. And then I have to go get my other layers and make sure the, the lineup and the lamination is good on there. So now I've run the risk that I have multiple lamination cycles and I could have skewing or other issues on my board if they don't stack up properly. And I've run the drill twice and I've taken more time of that drill operator that has a labor cost associated with it and the machine time and the setup time, et cetera. So even a small blind via can significantly increase the cost of your board. Factors, I mean, it just depends on the full board construction, but it can add up pretty, pretty quickly if you start doing that, especially if they're small holes that we'd use a laser drill for, et cetera. Um, this is just another example. Solder mass dams, minimum of four mil space. That's pretty standard across the industry. So between your SMT pads, you have like a small little clearance, like maybe two mil, two mil, and then in between that, you have a four mil space, and that's just you need to have some solder mask in between. And generally, for it to actually handle and like stay there, four mil is accurate. 
and then also the reason you need it is so they don't bridge when you do your, your reflow or your assembly. And this is via fill. This is a pretty expensive process. You can add like $1,000 to your board like instantly if you do via fill, depending on who you use, but it, it gets pretty expensive. And again, for the same reason, because you're running it through a bunch of different processes. And so if you use via in pad, via in pad is where if you have a BGA or some other part and you want to put a via underneath that pad so the connection goes right away to another layer, you don't have traces expanding out, it almost always requires via fill. There's just a cost associated with it. So it's not as easy as just dropping it in and making your design really nice and constrained. So the pad doesn't rip off so you don't have voids in the board, you almost have to have via fill. And there's other benefits of doing it too, especially if it's under a pad. Like via fill can be really good for conductive, just, uh, just heat transfer through the board and kind of out to the other side. So a lot of people use it for that as well. This is probably the most important one. So Royal Circuits is a board shop. We also own a company called Advanced Assembly. So they're actually all sort of tied together, same ownership between the businesses. Advanced Assembly, the latest stat, and I called right before, 15 years in the business, we have 15,000 active customers. 98% of jobs have an issue with them. I don't care if you are the top engineer at SpaceX, I don't care where you work, 98% of jobs have some sort of issue with them, no matter how clean the data is and the pre-processing, et cetera. But the issue isn't always that they're not manufacturable. In fact, the issue isn't at all that there's an issue with the board if you ultimately built it the way that they came in. The issue is almost 95% or 98% of that statistic is related to the bill of materials. This is the bane of every assembly shop's existence because they're all different even if you try to homogenize them and there's like we have a software on advanced assemblies tool you go on and you can pick your your columns it works out it's still there are still issues one the information generally it's a lack of information it's not there they don't put the manufacturer part number your reference designators don't match up etc but there's also issues with you picked one part and everything looks great and you have a manufacturer part number everything's filled out but when we go to order it it's an 06, it's an 0201, but you want an 0402. And we don't know. And the other issue is maybe you wanted that and you made the pad bigger so for future proofing, but there's no note there. And even if it would fit, if it's not an exact match between the Gerber or the, the board data and the bill of materials, we have to ask. And that ask process is going to slow you down. Because we're in the quick turn business and you guys are trying to get your boards faster and faster. So if you want a one day turn, which we do all the time, you want to make sure the input is as clean as possible so we can get it straight onto the floor, kit all your parts, put them on the pick and place, et cetera. So that's kind of the idea. Just be really, really like go over the top on your bomb and make sure it's as clean as possible. I'm sure Chris can probably attest to that. That's the bane of every assembly shop's existence is issues coming in on the bomb and having questions and holds based on that. So I went through a lot of this stuff earlier, but I'll just, at a very high level, with the limited time that I have left, go over how a fab shop prices their boards. So no fab shop, and this may be obvious to you, but you'd be surprised, it's not common knowledge. No fab shop builds boards individually, right? Like if you have a, a, even if you have a square shape board, I don't run that through the shop. We have to run a shop panel. And most shops have a standard panel size, 1824, 2124, et cetera. So you could put a bunch of different designs on your panel, which is what Eisler does. You can try to use a part of it, but no matter what, we still have a cost, which is the entire panel. So the more you fill up on that panel, the cheaper the unit cost per board is going to be for you no matter what because we have to charge you a minimum to run that big sheet of metal and its associated layers through the whole factory. And we have to test that whole board, we have to handle it, and it has to go through, and that's real estate. It's going through no matter what, whether you use one square inch or all 362 square available square inches of it or whatever. So understanding that and trying to optimize for panelization is a huge step, the thing that you can do in your, in your design. But... The, the weight in the formula is pretty much a factor of the size, how fast you want your turn time, 
which is probably the biggest factor, and then the number of layers. So what's the size of your board? How many can we fit on a panel? How many layers is it, and how fast do you want it? Based on those three factors, your price is going to come out pretty similar, and then you have adders, blind and buried vias, via fill. Do you have a random material that we don't stock, or like a 20-ounce copper, which we have seen, and it's crazy? Yeah, so things like that will add cost. And then on the assembly side, choosing easy to source, easy to assemble parts makes it easier for everybody, and obviously SMT is a lot cheaper than through hole because through hole has a human element to it, labor costs, and the time goes through the roof. So SMT is the way to go with that. And then the last one, I'm running out of time. I didn't realize I went in so much. Brief industry overview, because I think people like hearing about how the industry has progressed. In 2008, there was about 2,000 quick turn PCB shops in the United States. Today, there's like less than 135. So 95% reduction in, this, in, the, in the actual supply, people that can do this stuff, yet demand has more than tripled in that time. So the number of boards that people are ordering has gone up significantly, and the number of people, number of people individually that are consigning to build these boards has gone down considerably. A lot of that is due to private equity firms buying them, they're merging with big guys, et cetera. But the big thing is it costs more to keep up with today's technology, and a lot of people in business, especially in the 80s and 90s, doing two four-layer boards and making a killing, it's very difficult to continue doing that because now you need four or five laser drills. Now you need DC, AC plating, pulse plating. Now you need vision drill, vision route for depth drilling and back drilling and all these other things that technology just requires. And so to operate a business like that, it changes the game, and we then have to pass on that cost incrementally to the customer is getting more and more used to $2 boards and $3 boards. So kind of understanding where you stay in that consumer model and who the manufacturer is can help you also save some cost and make good decisions. But the other big thing is understanding who builds your boards. Aggregate systems, Isler, Arsh, probably these other guys, that can save you a ton of money because you're just paying for your piece on the panel. You're not paying for the whole panel. But if you have a 12-layer board with blind and buried and high-speed trace controlled impedance, et cetera, you better go with the board shop that's actually building it, see their factory, talk to the guys, the engineers at the shop, because that'll affect your cost for sure, and it'll certainly affect your turn time and the likelihood that you'll get it built. And the other thing is assembly and fab. Try to choose a shop that owns an assembly shop and owns a fab shop at the highest level. Most assembly shops, it's a pretty low margin business. You make your money off the markup on the bare board and on the overage on parts. If you own the board shop, if that company owns a board shop, that cost has gone down significantly because you're not brokering it out to a board shop. That's not always possible. And in the hacker hobbyist, Osh Park space, that's not necessarily true because like Worthington's able to offer incredible prices. But owning a board shop, when you have more complex builds and you need them on like a one day turn, can save you a ton of time because there's no brokering of communication and there's no brokering of the money or the, or the material in the process. And that's often hard because everybody disguises everybody as, as everybody, but sometimes for more complex builds where you really want to get down and try to save like a couple thousand bucks, that could be a smart move. So I got what, a minute? Not even? Okay. So last thing is this is something that we've built internally is Priority PCB. It's an API for PCB fab assembly and parts. So if anyone was interested and has a niche customer base and wants to sell boards and have an added revenue stream to their business, or if you're an assembly shop, or if you're a fab shop and you want to make it easier to order boards but you don't necessarily have a software team, we've built an API that you can use and integrate on your site to immediately that ties to our factory floor. So boards come in and they go straight to the floor. So you've cut out a huge human element in that process. Last one is just, I mean, slight promotion, pcblayout.com. We do layout, we do parts library management and things like that. So if you want more ongoing management or you have a dirty tarball of a set of libraries from 10 years of switching engineers, we can take care of that for you. And usually it only takes a couple of weeks to go through all your parts, homogenize the whole system for you. And then again, Royal Circuits, we have two fab shops in California, one in the Bay Area and one in Los Angeles. We do flex, rigid flex, and rigid boards. We stock a ton of material, been in the business 20 years. We own advanced assembly, so we do quick turn assembly as well, like super low volume, one board in one day, fab and assemble, 
done in 24 hours. And so that's kind of the, the state that we play at, and we can handle a lot of the HDI builds on a quick turn as well. So that's where I'll leave it at, at that. Thanks a lot for listening. Questions? Um, on the bomb, yes. what's, in your opinion, the most proper way to designate parts that aren't populated? Because I see in there you have, like, red. I don't know if no, that's... I think to be, be expl as explicit as you can, but be consistent. So if, don't put DNP and then DNI in this. Just be really clear. Most of the time it's pretty obvious. And, again, with our ordering system and... With most ordering systems for most assembly shops today, they're kind of up to speed, so they're going to catch it if it's a DNI or a DNP or something like that, for sure. All right, two quick ones. Uh, the base, you know, most of your business, do you find that you get one individual board design at a time, or do you, does the customer pre-panelize it themselves? It just depends. Okay. You know, it, it, it depends. A lot of time customers will say, hey, I got three, four designs from my team coming in at once. We will panelize it for you, and it's generally cheaper and easier for us to do that, so you don't need to worry about it, and it's not an added cost. Okay, that was my second question. Yeah, we're so happy to do it. So us being you guys. Yeah, us okay. as Royal Circuits or whoever. Um, and I think most port shops can attest to that. They're, they're happy to kind of auto-panelize for you, depending on the order. But that will save you a lot of money because, again, we run the whole panel. So if you fit four designs, the image, I don't care what it looks like. We just It's just an image. So to us, it doesn't matter. You still got to put it in your guys' labor to actually panelize the thing, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, that's a service that we offer. It's just part of our business. Yeah, good point. So there's, oh, I'm just going to stand over here. There's all these DFM and DFA uh, tricks that we as engineers pick up over time, just like yeah. from here and there, like on, on your page for with uh, solder mask dams yeah. uh, between the pads. Uh, one thing that I learned recently is if you have traces escaping from all different directions, then yeah. your AOI has a really hard time figuring out if the solder fillets are good. Yeah. So you want to like escape all your traces in the same direction. That's but a like, good point. How would someone know that if they didn't see it on a random Reddit post, for example? That I totally <laughs> saw. Um, so like, why don't or do board houses publish like a good checklist of like these are DFM things that like will solve ninety percent of the questions that we would have to ask you or we'd have to email you yeah. about, and then that would slow down your turn time. So the AOI thing, I I can't even say that that's made it harder for us to catch errors. Again, it depends on the board and the quality and the yield, but generally that's not an issue. But if it's like a BGA and you have, I mean, you're naturally going to have traces going everywhere. It's still just not an issue. You do an electrical test, you store on the AOI, but most board shops, us included, do have some sort of DFM checklist. But again, I think the industry is still so old school. People are like, I mean, I told you, there's 95% reduction in the number of individually owned corporate board shops that exist in the country in the last 10 years. So if you think about that, I mean, who was in business before, who's in business today, the way they're viewing it and trying to run it is also different. So that's, that's coming. And a lot of the new companies, us included, are like trying to figure out what can we do to make it easier on the engineer to design stuff that works because, oh, it turns out that's easier for us to build. And my yield goes up and we make more profit on the job. So, yeah, that's a great point. I think it's something to look forward to. So, All right, we're going to have to cut off the questions to keep going. Um, oh. here, I'm sure you'd be available for more questions. Yeah, I'm available. Yeah, you guys can ask me a question. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>